Hey guys, welcome to This Is Real. I'm JP Miller. And I'm Leslie McCarter. So uh, we are here actually on location for the first time. We are, we are. Because uh, some friends of mine, the Isaacs, and the matriarch and the mama, is that the right word, matriarch? Sure. <laughs> uh, the queen. The of, leader of the yeah, pack. Leader of the pack. Is uh, Lily Isaacs. And um, she has one of the my favorite stories of anyone's I've ever listened to. She has a fascinating story. Uh, really, of the faithfulness of God. True. Lily's story really um, begins before you were born uh, with your family. So Lily's got two books out. Um, it's called Don't Cry Out Loud. She wrote that, and then after this book was published, she learned more about her family, her story, and she needed to share it. So you take me from the top, and let's talk about your life. Lily Isaacs, thank thanks you. for being here. Thank yes, you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say, you know, today we're living in the day of cancel culture, and there are so many things in history that people want to erase. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've made it my life mission, yeah. especially the older I've gotten, that I'm not letting the story die. Yeah. So I try to share it everywhere I go. But my mother and father are both Polish Jews. They were born in the same hometown, didn't know each other in Poland, and it was a little town called Częstochow, Poland. So my father was uh, had five siblings and his parents at home. My mother had six siblings, and she had three at home with her, with her mother and father. And when World War uh, II broke out, um, my father has told me that it was September 1st, 1939, when the Nazi trucks came barreling through all the towns in Poland. And their little agricultural town of, you know, so many people right in the middle of the morning, these big, big uh, German trucks would pull into town. And the soldiers would get out on these big megaphones, and they started making announcements for all the people in every home to come out on the street. And uh, just yelling at people out, of, out on the street, and they would knock on every home door, walk through the house, make sure everybody in their homes was out on the street. But just think about it. In 1939, we didn't have internet. Mm -hmm. We didn't have TVs. We didn't have radio. Mm -hmm. The only time you knew what was going on in the world is if you found a newspaper somewhere or by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. That was it. So these poor people didn't know what was going on. They didn't have a clue. If there was a word of war, they didn't know that right. Poland was being invaded. So everybody followed the rules. They just get out of their house. They didn't know if the houses were going to burn down or something right. bad was going to happen. So everybody starts marching out on the, out of their homes. They came out. And my father said that uh, once they got out on the street, they made everybody get down on the ground with their hands behind their heads and lie there on the ground for hours, just hours. And then the soldiers started separating people. And they said, you go here and you go there and you go there and you go there. And they didn't even know where they were going. That's the last time my father separated father's families. Separated families, husbands from wives, children's Can parents. Can you imagine separating them? Children. And make yes. And if you didn't follow the rules, you were shot immediately. Which in happened front of everyone. in front of everyone. So you had to follow the rules. They didn't even still didn't know. So my father and his brother were the only two that were together, separated from his other siblings, his parents, my mother. The same way, she only had one sister with her, her mother and her father and her other sister and her brother, all in different places. So finally, when they started setting, sending them onto these trucks, they put them on trains, mm -hmm. and they wound up in some type of a facility for a while. Uh, it was kind of like a pre-concentration camp mm -hmm. uh, place. A bunch of them people put, still had no idea what was going on. And I've often wondered, how can you kill six million people and the people not fight back? Right. I mean, if you thought your family would die with you, could you would yeah. you not fight back or try? Right. But they didn't know. They were clueless. Mm -hmm. And this was all in Hitler's mind because he thought if he could get them there and starve them, then they wouldn't have the strength to fight back once they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. So my father and his brother were sent to um, a concentration camp in Germany from Poland uh, called Buchenwald Concentration Camp. That's Why where they are stayed. they called concentration camps? Because there were concentrated people, like 100 people were in barracks, I guess. I, that'd be a good thing to Google. I don't know. Okay. But I guess because they were all concentrated or shoulder to shoulder. Right. Okay. Uh, then my mother and her sister, Sonia Zlata, uh, were also together. Mm -hmm. And uh, both my mother and father never saw any of their family ever again. None. 
after the day after they the day the they train. were separated they never saw them again so and had no way of finding they? out so my mother I mean, this was just all happened in one day one day without warning had no idea you might have to get me a tissue <laughs> i already feel it coming so on my, my mother wow. was 19 my father was 29 he was 10 years older but they were both still living at home yeah. they'd never met each other um, so my father wound up in Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany. Thanks. Uh, my mother wound up in Bergen-Belsen, Germany at a concentration camp with her sister as well. So what happened was a lot of these people that when Hitler came into Europe, he was gathering all of the Jewish people in different countries, not only Poland, Yugoslavia, everywhere. And he concentrated them all in Germany so that he could keep his thumb on it. Mm -hmm. He could because, Right. Then, you know, eventually when everybody else got involved in the war, which I don't understand why it took so long for the world right. to find out what's going on, you know, but the Americans and the British started coming in. He wanted all of the prisoners in his country. Mm -hmm. So that's why he put them all. So my mother has described to us, okay, so my mother was very vocal about her story. She'd tell us everything we wanted to know all of her life. My father, not so much. Mm -hmm. Quiet man, very quiet. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about my father was he became an alcoholic. Even though he worked hard, he was a bread baker, uh, worked all night, but a lot of times he'd come home stumbling up the street because he drank at work. Mm -hmm. And that embarrassed me. I was always mad at him for embarrassing me because he was drunk. But I didn't know. I couldn't yeah. get into his brain. I didn't know what he was dealing with. Right. Since then, I've had so much time to think about it. He passed away in 1978 at the age of 69. I thought he was living with survivor's guilt mm -hmm. or something, you know, and he didn't know how to articulate trauma. trauma. I mean, I mean trauma. I, and when you're drunk or high or whatever it is yeah, that you do you for that it. moment, right. you've got peace or whatever, and, but it doesn't well, last. It doesn't last. But we would ask my father, you know, Daddy, what happened to your family? He said, oh, they died in the war. That's all we got out of him. They died in the war. But my mother, she was a little bit more, she, she told us a lot more. She said once they got to, uh, to the camp that they were going to from Poland, they took a train ride for three days and nights. And they were all sandwiched in there standing up. Never had a place to sit. No food, no water, no toilet facilities. Three days and nights. So literally, they're standing. Standing. And there's kids. There's, yes. And so, so they saying, use the bathroom on, on each other. On each other. There's no food. You're if you, exhausted. If you pass out or die, you're standing up. No place to go. And mom said there was nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing. She said when the rain would come, there was a little crack in the ceiling of that train, and every one of them would have their mouths open to try to get a touch of that water. Wow. I can't imagine that. No, you know, what cruelty, right? So anyway, they wind up at their destinations, and uh, my father was with his one brother, never found out what happened to the rest of his family. My mother with her sister, she did find out through a neighbor that after mom was gone, there was a neighbor who told somebody, told somebody, she found out that her mother and her sister and her other brother that were at home were shot immediately in the home. They never made it out. Uh, she and her sister did survive. They lived through a lot, a lot of stories that I tell in my book, detailed stories that mom, you know, did to survive. Uh, my father, just little tidbits here and there. My father said that on the holidays, uh, that when they were in the camps, of course, they just got one meal a day, which was one crust of bread and a cup of hot water. That was it. And Every they day. did that on purpose? On purpose. Just to try to keep them alive? To enough. starve them, you yeah. know, whatever, I, yeah. So some people got greedy and they started hiding bread. They'd mm -hmm. save it for the next day and the next day. So their stomachs would shrink up. When they did eat, their stomachs would burst and they'd die. I mean, they just didn't want to eat because they were afraid they wouldn't get any more. Right. Things like that. You know, the barracks were full of lice. Uh, they they disease. had disease. Oh, sure. uh, they had to march the people out from one place to another in freezing cold weather with no clothes, no shoes, just all kinds of horror stories. Um, then certain camps did certain things. You know, of course, in Auschwitz, they tattooed all the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the camps my parents were in, they did not do that. But my mom said that they did shave the heads of all the people when they came into the camps. And I never understood that till just recently, why they did that. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. But um, just lived through the most horrible times. You know, they were made to do a lot of carrying 
one thing to another place for no reason, just to weaken them and, you know, mm -hmm. to do what they want. And that lasted about two years. Now your mother is still living? No. no. I lost my mother in 2014, but she was 95 when she passed wow. away. So she, yeah, yeah, she lived a long time. My father, not so much. Yeah. I don't know if his drinking was a problem. Maybe his right. kidneys, I don't know. Um, but I was at both of their bedsides before mm -hmm. they died. Mm -hmm. um, my mother... Uh, said that when the war was over and they were liberated by our blessed American soldiers and our British allies, mm -hmm. she always said it in her thick Polish accent. I still hear her today. Mm -hmm. She said, when those American soldiers busted through those gates, they looked like angels from heaven. <laughs> That's what she said. And it was true. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of organizations came into Germany. Uh, my parents were sent to Munich where there was a it was kind of like, they called them displaced persons camps because there were so many people that were displaced from their homes and their families and had no place to go back to and didn't, yeah. they were sick and starved and mm -hmm. didn't know really what had happened to everybody. Mm -hmm. So United Jewish Appeal, the Red Cross, B'nai B'rith, a lot of organizations came into Europe and started helping everybody find their families, mm -hmm. uh, give them medication, uh, nurse them back to health and help them yeah. to find who was missing and who was going. So... My parents met in that French Army Relief Camp in Munich, and that's where they got married there. Mm. So uh, then a couple years later, I was born in Munich, and they stayed another two years. Uh, in those days, in the late 40s, you had to have a sponsor to send for you to help you get a job, whether it be Australia or England or America. To or go where, to another country? To go to another country. Okay. You had to have a sponsor. You couldn't just go. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have money to do anything, right. right? So my mother had an uncle, her mother's brother, who was in America during the war. Mm -hmm. And he knew that my mom had survived. So he sent for my mother and my father and myself. So we got on a ship. We went through New York City, uh, past Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty on this big ship. I was two. I don't remember that, but my mother would describe it. And, and it uh, wasn't like a cruise ship. No, it was just a big ship of people that they were taking from one place you to another. I this mean, this is just, her life. Yeah, I it's mean, a movie. It is. You got to America. So we got to America. Two. I was two, and I don't remember that. But yeah. just things my parents had told me. And my uncle taught my father how to be a bread baker, and we lived with him for a while. Then my parents got a little apartment. Mm -hmm. So that was my life. And so you were in New Brooklyn? York City, Bronx, 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 New York, and so you know we started life anew. Um, when I was nine, my parents and I became American citizens, and we had you remember to remember that? I do remember that. My parents oh. had to study for a test. I had to learn how to write my name in cursive, and I was so excited. <laughs> I think I changed You're my like, I'm in. I no. changed my clothes ten times, wanting to look just right, and I still have my citizenship paper sitting on my mantle oh. that I signed, and we were proud. You know, we stood with about 200 other people, and we had our hand on a Bible, and mm -hmm. we promised that we would be good Americans mm -hmm. and all that, and you know, it meant something in those days. Yeah. Yeah. It did. <laughs> Not now. I know. And we worked hard for that. Yeah. yeah. And we were proud of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was so proud that day. But what's, you know what, I'm still proud today. Yeah. That this country gave yeah. my chance, my family a, a chance, chance to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so anyway, that was my young life. My mother was a really good singer. She never had a chance at professional singing, but she and I would love to go to Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. Living in the city, that was easy for us. So she always had hopes and dreams that I would become a Broadway actress. So I studied acting in school. I was in every school play, mm -hmm. and I landed a part in Off-Broadway, which she was proud of. That was mm -hmm. kind of cool. And that was my goal in life, was to be mm -hmm. a Broadway actress and make my parents proud. And uh -huh. so um, I even went to Woodstock Theater to do an apprenticeship there for one summer. Almost met Bob Dylan there. <laughs> so what year is this? This is, is this? in 1968. So you Woodstock. Were, you were there, like in New York City, in that iconic yes. time of arts and music and mm -hmm. really everything that was just changing. Yes. And you were kind of running I was in there. that crowd. I was. I was running in that crowd. To me, that's like so cool. <laughs> well, I mean, did you ever run into like celebrities? Yes, and, and I you did. With them well, I was going to tell you, I went to Woodstock. Me and my girlfriends drove up there. 
It was about a two-hour drive. Somebody mm -hmm. had a driver's license, but by the time we got there, were probably a half a million people there, oh and it was horrifying. So what was the point? Yeah. I mean, you know, so we stayed about an hour, and mm -hmm. it was just everything in the world. You well, couldn't even hear the music. There. We were there. The music seemed like it was ten miles away. So we left Woodstock and we went back home. But uh, my girlfriend and I, we went to Carnegie Tech, which was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one summer. I went because I got a scholarship through my acting courses that I from high school mm -hmm. to take this acting course from the Actors Guild at the college. So my roommate that I had just met was a musician, mm -hmm. and I had a folk guitar. At those days, you know, you have to think, Peter, Paul, and Mary were popular. Simon yeah. and Garfunkel was just mm -hmm. hitting the scene. The Beatles, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan. Magic right. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> what other songs are like iconic then? Um, the Beatles, of course, yesterday. Yeah. And then uh, Bob Dylan, the times they were changing. And Peter, Paul, and Mary, they did so many of them. I mean, I can't even think off the top but of my head. But you were kind of around those folks in the city during that I time. What? Every Sunday, they would have picking in the park at Washington Square Park in oh, the village. Cool. We were there almost every Sunday. Mingling. How old were you? Doing stuff we weren't supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I know how old you were. 19? <laughs> no, that's, they were, you were 19? Yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> being 19 then? I relate to her. I am a hippie. So, okay, you're you're in the you're yeah. at the village, you're you're folkin. Right with folk. And so Maria cut it. F O L K I N to folk. So you so folk you're music. in the village, right. you're doing your thing. So we go to Carnegie Tech and Maria and I are sitting around the dorms with our our nylon string guitars, picking all these songs, and we started writing some songs. Well, somebody in the dorm heard us and said, you know what, you guys, I have a party coming up soon. Would you guys think about singing at it? And this is after we got back to the city. He called, and he, we said, well, sure, we had nothing else to do. It was a Saturday night, and we took the subway. I think it was somewhere in Long Island, and we mm -hmm. took our guitars, and you know, it took about two hours to iron our Then you didn't have a flat iron. Th listen then to this. you had a regular iron. And you ironed your hair. You had to have, a, like, a diaper or something cloth over your hair, and then you used a regular iron. I've never done it to myself, but I have heard this, and yeah. I'm thankful wow. for real iron. <laughs> but that's the only way we knew how yeah, to do it. Yeah, isn't that it. funny? Wow. So we went to the party, and we we sang. We had a really good time. I don't think we made any money. We just did it for the fun of it. At that party, this young man comes up to us and he says, would you guys like to audition for Columbia Records? And we looked at him. He was about our age, you know, with, oh yeah. Yeah, sure. You're trying right. to get He yeah. said, can you give me your number and we'll get in touch with you? And we looked at each other and we thought, all right. So we just gave him our home number. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't have cell phones. My then. cell in <laughs> We didn't have cell. <laughs> yeah. So, and if we thought, oh, we'll never hear from him right, again, right. you know, whatever. Well, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, he called. He said, I have an audition set up for you next week on Wednesday, whatever. Can you show up at noon? West 57th Street, Broadway Studios. Oh, from, from working a gig in Long Island, yeah. you and your buddy... Took so your it's, guitar on the subway. it's just you and a friend, and yes. did he want both of you to come? Yes. Or just you? Okay. Both, no, the group. Okay. He wanted us to sing yeah. for Columbia Records, and we thought, is this real? Right. Well, we, you know, we got ready, and it took us two days to find out what we're going to wear. Sure. <laughs> two days to iron yeah. our hair. Yeah. And we got on the subway with our guitars, and we get off at 52nd, I forgot, I forgot what 50th Street walked, and we were so nervous, oh my God, we didn't know what we were expecting. Walk into this big room, and there were six executives from Columbia, and they have two chairs for us, like up on a little riser, and they said, do your stuff, we want to hear your songs. We sang maybe four songs mm -hmm. of our originals, walked out of that place with a contract on Columbia Records. And you're 19? I'm 19, she's 19. I mean, that was, like, unbelievable. So because of that album, we started getting uh, to do gigs in Greenwich Village. Yeah. Like, we were at the Bitter End Cafe. Uh, we were at Gertie's Folk City, which was a big hot yes. spot. These nightclubs were where all these other artists mm -hmm. had been. And I got to meet Linda Ronstadt, Joan oh, wow. Baez. Uh, and I almost met Bob Dylan, but I wouldn't have talked to him. I was embarrassed to touch him because you didn't have a cell phone there to take a picture. Here I was. Yeah. Right. But anyway, it was just the coolest thing ever. We were living on cloud nine. And we did the Gertie's Folk City thing for six weeks, mm -hmm. one summer. And we'd sing, and there was another band there that came in from Kentucky, mm -hmm. a bluegrass band. Mm -hmm. Which is hilarious. Which is hilarious. But I was impressed because the musicianship was really right. cool, and yeah. it was artsy-like folk music. Yeah. Uh, and the songs were kind of lo love and life, kind of like folk music, too. Right. Mm -hmm. But I never heard a banjo before my life. The Beverly yeah. Hillbillies was the only right. place I heard yeah. a banjo. <laughs> I never heard it live, you know. So Isn't here's that funny <laughs> that so many people that are not used to... I remember talking to Lulu Roman. She grew up as a hippie and, you know, California and stuff. And she's like, 
steel guitar. You know, yeah. what is that what stuff? What is that? You right. Know, she didn't have no idea. So you were, you see this bluegrass band. Right. And there was a bass player, a guitar player, a banjo player, and a mandolin player. And the banjo player was really handsome. Dark, dark eyes, and just, you know, cowboy hat. Mm -hmm. he, he was a real cowboy, you know, and that kind of interested me. Because I was just a Jewish kid from the Bronx, so I never met anyone like that. Yeah. Well, we started dating. Mm -hmm. And with a name like Isaacs, his, uh, the leader of the band introduced everybody. He said, this is the only Jewish boy I know from Kentucky. Make welcome Joe Isaacs. I said, oh, well. That he's Jewish, my parents would be happy, and you know, so we started yeah. dating a little, and anyway, found out a little later on that he wasn't Jewish, just the name. But it had but a anyway, great Jewish great name. Great Jewish name. Yeah. But when the gig was over, he went back to Kentucky, where he lived. So we just thought we'd never see each other again. Sure. Well, one day he decided he was going to move to New York and start his own band. So when he moved to New York, that's when we started dating seriously and we decided we'd get married. Mm -hmm. He lived in New York for a whole year. And I was ready for a change at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought, well, I tried everything I could and I was fascinated with Kentucky and, you know, the mountains and I'd never seen anything like mm -hmm. that before. So we got married and we moved to Ohio because that's where his work was. And I went ahead and got an office job. So my music career was basically over. But, you know, it was a different phase and I was very adventurous in those days. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to try something mm -hmm. different. So how old were you when you got married? I was 22. 22. And he was 23. Okay. Um, and uh, when he took me up in the holler in Kentucky, I thought we were going to the mm -hmm. end of the world. Did you world hear what she said? The holler. The holler. How That's do you right. say it? That's right. Okay. The holler. The holler. Down here. <laughs> um, you had to drive through a stream, and his parents lived without uh, electricity, no running water, and outhouse. Can you imagine moving like, from oh New York City to Kentucky with no electric? Well, I visited. I didn't live there. Okay. <laughs> we lived Were in you Ohio. Shock, shock. The first night we spent with his parents, um, it, it started storming, and with the tin roof, it sounded like the house was falling in. I got in bed with his mother. It's the first day I ever met her. I love that. Sound. Yeah. You just went and ran. In I there. just ran in there and I just got in bed with her. I didn't That's know what to expect. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. But anyway, it was just adventurous. <laughs> and so, you know, but then we back to Ohio and he worked a job. I worked a job. Then our kids started being born and Ben was my firstborn. During that time, my parents um, found out uh, that I was, well, in that interim, before we had kids, my ex-husband had a brother that was three years older than he was. He was 27. He got killed in a car accident one night, in the middle of the night, around Christmas time. Wife and four small children at home. It was devastating. And so uh, the funeral was in a church. Mm -hmm. I'd never been in a church in my life, ever. And, of course, we had to go to the funeral, and we did. And I noticed that people were so warm and engaging and people mm -hmm. I'd never met and the family. It was kind of heartbreaking. There was a lot of tears and sorrow because of the tragedy. So anyway, after the funeral, my sister-in-law said, let's meet again at the church tomorrow night before everybody parts and goes back to Indiana and Ohio, wherever they live, one more time. Mm -hmm. And I was really debating whether I should go or not. I know this is not my style. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to expect. My parents are going to die. Right. When they find out I went church. to church. Right. But I thought, I can't be a family member and not go and honor, you know, the memory of right. my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. So I went. I sat in the very, very last pew. Mm -hmm. And I felt like putting a coat over my head because I was really embarrassed mm -hmm. about being there. It was a real small church. And the people just were weeping and hugging and engaging. And I thought, you know, this is just a beautiful community. It seemed like everybody was so warm and friendly. Mm -hmm. And people that weren't even family were that mm -hmm. way. And so, honestly, I don't know how, the pastor got up and he said, anybody that needs a touch from God, you know, the altars are opened or pray your own way. And I'd never done that before in my life. And honestly, I don't know how I did it or why. I was in the last pew. I got down on my knees and put a coat over my head in the last pew of the church. Yeah. And I cried. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say. Yeah. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to ask God to mm -hmm. forgive me or knew nothing about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I cried. Mm -hmm. And that's why my girls wrote that song, He Understands My Tears. Mm -hmm. Because I say the minute my flesh hit the floor, God already saw my heart. Mm -hmm. I didn't yes. have to say a word. He already mm -hmm. saw my heart was opened. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my relationship of knowing Jesus as yeah. Messiah. Because of that, my parents found out about my church going through a cousin. And they were quick to call me on the phone and tell me that if I did not give up that crazy religion I'd found, that I could forget about ever having a family again. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? No. And my father said he'd rather see me dead, buried in the grave, than to reproach my people the way I did. And I cried for days. But, you know, it had to be one of the hardest times in my life 
that really drew me close to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He became my father. He mm -hmm. became my mother. He became my everything. Mm -hmm. And I really wept my way into salvation for that mm -hmm. reason. And he became that. Mm -hmm. I, the first time you, I heard you wow. talk about that, I thought, like, why would they be so against or why would they be so anti? And I think this is important to put out mm -hmm. that it's not erased because it, peop, sometimes people were the only Jesus people see or whatever. Hitler used scriptures and manipulated them to mm -hmm. kill and, and discourage and destroy. So all they knew of Jesus, Christianity, mm -hmm. they were doing it wrong, but that's all that they knew. Right. So he associated. Right. You know, that's how dangerous, you know, wrong leadership it, is. It is. So they didn't want you a part of that. Mm -hmm. Right. The, a lot of the soldiers wore these big belt buckles. The Nazi soldiers said, God is with us. And so many people were down Jesus. on their knees getting ready to be assassinated, and that's the last thing they saw. Ugh. And yes, yeah. you're very right. So yeah. they didn't, it, of course it was not at all like that, but that's just the impression Jewish people yeah. got. And I know, don't it, blame them. It, yeah. I but mean, it broke my heart because it wasn't that. Yeah. And here I am finding my way through, and it, it went on that way till Ben was born. When I gave birth to Ben, my parents couldn't stay away. Mm -hmm. First grandchild, first American born. Right. So what kind of reconnected us? But we still had trouble talking mm -hmm. about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And every time we would, it would start a big argument. Mm -hmm. So one day in prayer, I said, Lord, how do I do this? You know, I don't want to lose my family. I don't want to lose you. And God spoke to me in an audible voice in my spirit and said, you don't have to say anything. Just live the life in front of them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. That's what I tried to do. Mm -hmm. I was never forceful. You know, of course, they ask questions, I'd answer, but we've had our ups and downs, but that's the way we got through it. So you're married now. You've got Ben. You're living, you're in Ohio. Yes. Um, so what happened next? Like the girls or did how you many, Now, how many are, are there? How many kids? Three. You have three yeah. kids. Okay. Ben was born in 1972, uh, and then uh, Sonia was born in 1974. So I thought, well, I got my girl and my boy, you know, I'm good, and, you know, we'll move on. At that time, I left my job, and Joe was working steadily. Uh, we weren't singing that much, you know, just at church on Sundays, not a whole lot. He and I both would together. At that time, I was still playing the guitar, he and I. And it was just for fun. Then about, uh, I was pregnant, let's see. I mean, I, Sonia was four months old, five months old, when I found out I was pregnant again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was devastating. Yeah. I thought, oh, my God. So anyway, I had another baby, so there's a year between them. So three small children you know, that are three and under. And so I, I was busy being a mom, just a mom. Mm -hmm. And then we started singing at churches more a little bit, and then people started asking, will you come to our church? Will you come to our church? And it just kind of blossomed from there where then our children were old enough to start performing their own, mm -hmm. on their own. So bass, uh, Ben on bass, and Sonia on the mandolin, Becky on the guitar, just when they were teenagers, mm -hmm. they started. And then we became the Isaacs. Wow. That's awesome. Now, they're all married and have kids now, yes. too? So the, the Isaac started, um, and you, you guys went into kind of a new season for new places that exposed you up to travel some to different kinds of churches. The kids were exposed, you know, to ministry. So were you all doing that all the time when they were, how old were they? Yeah, I mean, we just weekends, basically, okay. like Saturdays and Sundays, because they were in school. My kids all went to public school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically on weekends, we'll do a church on a Saturday or on a Sunday in a van and then mm -hmm. come home. And, you know, it's just little by little that way mm -hmm. um, until they got old enough to, when they were teenagers, they started doing a lot of their own songwriting. Mm -hmm. And the three of them would sing, you know, their harmonies were always tight. Mm -hmm. So we'd feature them on a few songs. And then as they got older, it just became mostly focused on them mm -hmm. because of what they did, you know. So that's the way we moved on. Actually, to tell you when it really, like, blew up for us, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't really have no idea. Mm -hmm. It was just, we'd done it for so long, it just happened. Yeah. And uh, we started getting more calls from different states and different promoters and we signed with the Eddie Crook company you know then Crossroads and then you know it, and it now, just okay, are we allowed to say about <clears throat> Reba McIntyre sure and now Reba McIntyre we're on the Reba McIntyre tour, tour. this spring yeah so we just spring, found out last week shows? it's 15 shows, oh, 15 shows in every state 
It's amazing. They are going to be opening, opening up. Yes. Reba, Reba, Reba. I know. I can't believe that. What an Which is really cool. If you ever go back to, what was it, like our first show? Yeah, we did I really tribute. think it was our first show. We were playing a game, and uh, JP had to guess if I was lying or not. And I said, my mom was a Reba McIntyre impersonator. <laughs> and, of course, he already knew that. But, yes, my mom used to be a Reba McIntyre impersonator, so I think it's cool but that y'all are going to be re that y'all be opening for yeah. her. That's really cool. They and that's done, big. Mount, they have, um, you know, I know, like, they're members of the op Grand Old yeah, Opry. Yeah, it's just a year now. They yep. have um, done every major thing in, our, in Southern Gospel. You know, they're yeah. on the Gaither tour. They've done, you know, but they also, because of their bluegrass, uh, they have merged, you know, into to country. I mean, contemporary, like, they, mm -hmm. can, they can fit in anywhere. And you've had a lot of success, done a lot of awards. They played, our, I think, and I want to put this up if we can, you all were playing, I think, Carnegie Hall with the Gators yes. when your mom yeah. came. And I think we have a clip of that. That'd be cool. Um, her, her mom comes out and talks. She's in Carnegie Hall wow. singing. Can it was you? right after 9-11, too. Wow. Like three months after 9-11. Yeah. So wow. it was a patriotic theme, and she was perfect, what she said. You can play it. This is a very special night for the Isaacs. It's a singing family from uh, Tennessee, but it didn't start there. I was born in Germany after World War II, and I grew up in the Bronx, lived there for 22 years. And my mother is here, a survivor of the Holocaust. Her name is Faye Blauschild, and I want to introduce her to everyone tonight. Bill, um, I don't, of course, remember a lot about Europe because I came over here when I was two years old. But I do remember the day that my parents and I went to Ellis Island and what an excitement it was for a Jewish family from Europe to become American citizens. I remember it because I was nine years old. And to just see the Statue of Liberty. And Mom, do you want to say one thing? I'm very proud to be an American now. <laughs> So what will they be doing? Like, are, are they are they going to be doing more gospel? Or are they going to be doing more country? Well, kind of a we, mix? The last album we put out had no gospel songs on it. It's mm -hmm. called The American Face. Mm. It was just songs that we grew up loving, that my yeah. kids grew up loving, and songs that my girls had written. Because we've been blessed to do a lot of genres, like mm -hmm. you said. Right now, I'd say 90% of our performances are in performing arts centers. Um, They're not churches. Mm -hmm. And I love that mm -hmm. because it broadens our outreach. You're reaching mm -hmm. a different audience. Right. And so we'll do 75% of our show is songs they've known, songs we've recorded, but then at least 25% or more are gospel songs. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen our show, we don't preach. We don't do a lot of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff unless somebody really has something burning on their heart. Mm -hmm. But you do a song like It Is Well With My Soul. Well, my kids mm -hmm. do that. I'm in the mm -hmm. house. And, oh, wow. you know, I'll tell my story. Uh, we try to minister. And we touch people. We've met people that don't even go to church. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love right. the fact that we can spread our wings. So I have mm -hmm. no idea what to expect with the Reba tour, except that God's put us there yeah. and we're willing to do what whatever we need What an amazing open door. Yes, that's absolutely. A, especially in, I guess, what we want to call a secular world. Do you yeah. know right. what I mean? Right. What an amazing open door. Man, God's going to use y'all big. Lily, you've written a book um, which is called Don't Cry Out Loud. Yes. It's literally her story, and she goes in more in depth about the concentration camp with the, with the parents coming to America, her life in the city, you know, this hippie meeting a Christian bluegrass player in Greenwich mm -hmm. Village, that's unheard of. <laughs> you couldn't even imagine that. Yeah. And how she came to um, know Jesus like that. And, and even like in Pentecost, I mean, that was even more weird than your life. You yeah. know what I mean? You told me once about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Tell that story for me. Okay. So in Judaism, it's like one of the most important Jewish laws there is, is that every male child that's born has to be circumcised by a rabbi mm -hmm. on the eighth day. At this time, I was already going to church regularly, and this was my life. I wasn't going to the synagogue, and mm -hmm. even though I was proud of being Jewish, I still tried to observe that. I was a Messianic Jew. I believed in Messiah and all mm -hmm. that. So when Ben was born, I did not get a rabbi to come to the hospital to circumcise him. Well, my parents found out they were very, very upset, mm -hmm. right? 
So, again, the whole disowning thing and all this stuff, and he's going to hate me for saying this. <laughs> Did I say I'm not Ben? I said, but that's just the Jewish law, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a revival going on in our hometown, and uh, Ben was just a few days old, and I said, I just need something. I've just got to have some kind You're of... You're so broken. I'm broken, right. So, you know, we went to church, and I was carrying my baby, and uh, they were singing, and, you know, I was weeping mostly because the whole thing happening again. And so this lady walked in, and she started screaming at the top of her lungs and running through the church like she had a demon in her. Something was mm -hmm. scary. I'd never seen anything mm -hmm. like that before. I'm like, what I is knew, this woman I know. Doing? I knew enough of the Bible to just know that there was a scripture and that it said that, that uh, Jesus cast the demons out of this man. They went into swine, and then they, right, you know. Yeah ran off this cliff, and I thought, oh, God, don't let a demon come right. out of this woman. My baby's the first time in church. <laughs> and I was praying over Ben so hard yeah. that I think I started speaking in tongues. I didn't even well, know it. Yeah. And my sister-in-law saying, sitting behind me when church was over. She said, Lily, did you know you're speaking tongues? I said, I, what? She said, yeah. She said, you're speaking tongues. I didn't even recognize it. Isn't that cool? But That's it was awesome. because I was praying so fervently over my baby to protect him, not let anything any bad spirit just mm -hmm. attack him mm -hmm. that God blessed me. But when I come to realize he was eight days old mm -hmm. that day. Really? Wow. You're like, hey, he might not have been circumcised, but he got by a something rabbi. better. But I mean, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, by rabbi. Yeah. yeah. But he, but God gave us a different gift. Wow. More important gift. Wow. So that's awesome. <laughs> Lily's book talks all about that. There's tons of cool pictures from back in the day, like her parents. You even put some yeah, stuff I did. about like... Um, the, the Holocaust papers. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what an amazing story. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's it's so important that our children know that this is real, that it's not, uh, because all the survivors now are gone, right? Most, there's still maybe 100,000 left, but they were children during the war. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of them are in their 90s. So, mm -hmm. yes, and we have a nonprofit called the Isaacs Foundation where we bless the ones that oh, are still left awesome. with yeah. food wow. and yeah, clothing. But, you know, just to like think, that. like, if your parents didn't make it through, you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. And if My you weren't wouldn't. here, there'd be no Isaacs. That's right. So it, God is a good God, and man, he can take anything and turn it around. He can. He sure can, and, and bless you even more abundantly than you could even imagine. Yes. You Lily know? goes in her book, talks about her kids, and kind of really up until pretty current. But a few years ago, because of technology, because you went in, to other countries and visited stuff and researched your family, you found out more information and you needed to publish another book that almost continues your story. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, we've gone to Israel 17 times. Every two years we go, we take people with us. We're going again in May, I hope, Lord willing. Go to Isaacs.com if yeah. you've never uh, wanted to go to Israel yeah. or whatever, or if, you've, if you ever wanted to. How cool would it be to go with yeah. Jewish mm -hmm. people? So they take folks with them. Right. But we went to the Holocaust Museum like we always do in Jerusalem. It's called Yad Vashem. And I didn't know that I could enter my parents' names into this Hall of Fame that they have there just by bringing their release papers from camp. So I took the stuff with me. My family and I went in and talked to the officials there. And they actually got to enter their name into this Wall of Fame. And that felt so good to do that. Yeah. But when I got home about a month later, they started sending me emails about my mother and father's family, which I knew a lot about mom. But my father's family, I found out from the documents they had sent me, all of his family went to a Treblinka concentration camp in northern Poland. They were all gassed in the gas chambers, and then their bodies were burned in ovens and thrown like trash, the ash, somewhere up in Poland. That's what happened to his family, and I couldn't believe it. And so I got to researching Treblinka concentration camp. I didn't know anything about that mm -hmm. camp. And that's the camp where I learned where they shaved all the people's hair off their mm -hmm. body, their heads, everywhere. Men, women, children, everybody went into that camp. And I found that the reason why. Because they were steps away from the ovens. Steps away. And I'm thinking, why would you do that when they're going to die anyway? The reason they did it, and this just devastated me, is because the cyanide that they use to gas the people, the only thing it sticks to is hair. So when the people would die, the Nazi soldiers had to go in and remove the bodies so they could take them to the ovens to burn them, and they didn't want to get infected with cyanide. So that's why they shave the people's mm -hmm. hair wow. steps away from their death. That's I heard crazy. a, a, I mean, a, a, a lady that had been, I don't know if it was that one or if they did it at other places, but she, she got to the point, she lived, but she got to the point where they shaved her and something happened and they mm -hmm. stopped the line or whatever. But she said, 
it was, they were naked and it was so humiliating. You know, they would laugh about it. Yeah. And she said they would even pour like alcohol on places that were shaved just to be mean. Yeah, intimidation. It, it, it blows my mind that evil is, is real like that. I, you I know, can't. I, 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 that's that's another kind of level of evil. I mean, evil is evil. I know. But it's sickening. It really is. It's sickening. It's just, it's heartbreaking. You're, so you, you, you've got your book out. You're out doing your thing. You're, y'all are singing everywhere. But you're like, wow, I'm finding information out about my heritage. Because there's no graveyard. No there's thing. no marker. There's no not thing. even, you don't even know, you know what I mean? Right. Where, what happened? Mm -hmm. So was this, I'm sure it rebirthed something in oh, you. Oh, I can't tell. I cried for days. Mm -hmm. I cried for days because my, my father did even now. And I really, I grieved about it. But I just took a deep breath and thought, well, that's why I had to write my book. I just poured all of my emotions into the book, and yeah. I said, I've got to let the world know. I can't let this memory die, mm -hmm. and that's just my goal. Yeah, absolutely, and I know that that's going to touch so many so many others. It has me today. I didn't know any of this. Like, <laughs> you, you had mentioned some, uh, like, I'm talking like two seconds worth, and I was like, this is going to be interesting, you know, but wow. What a right when you Thank think you. you have a testimony and then you meet someone, you're like, Holy That's why I'm always like, my favorite is Lily. Aww, I mean, it could be so a movie. Sweet. It could be. But it the, could the be. thing that Lily is, and really her family, you know, are devoting their lives to is to making sure this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. I heard, I think it was Andy Andrews say, he's, who's a speaker, I think he wrote your foreword. Yes, he did. You know, he wrote that little book. And Six, he said, yeah, you know, how, how do you kill 11 million people? You lie to him. And he told a story about on the train, like Lily said, they're, they're worse than cattle. They're literally standing against each other three days. No food, no bathroom, no drink. You've got babies and old people. When they moved, dead people would just die. You would be seeing as a dead person. And they went by a church, a Christian church, and the people knew what time the train was coming in. And he said the organ and the people would sing loud so they didn't have to hear people screaming on the train or crying. And you think about how could Christians allow that to happen? Let's look at our life today mm -hmm. because stuff still happens today. Oh, yeah. And do we ever let the noise cancel out because we don't want to deal with it? No. It was a Christian church with a train track going right beside him, and they would sing louder so they couldn't hear the cries from the train. That just kills me. And easily, you could have been like, of course your dad was an alcoholic. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I get it, you know? You have worked and chosen to take a different path mm -hmm. and because of that your your family your children have been able to reach the world with mm -hmm. the gospel you have mm -hmm. it's come at a pretty high price yeah we don't even have all the stuff that she's been through <laughs> mm -hmm. but I, I would love for you all just to check her book out lily is a perfect example of what satan intended to destroy and and got close got close and she was around. like, uh-uh, I'm going to mm -hmm. place my trust in, in, in this. And didn't even know what was going on, but she knew it was God. Right. You when know? you know, and you know, and you just, like we've said, when you taste it and you've seen, you can't turn back. You can't. I mean, that's right. wow. I would love for you to check it out. Check out the Isaacs. Mm -hmm. um, we'll put their links or whatever in here. But Lily does go and share her story. Yes. So if you want her to come to your church... Uh, you can schedule her to do that if you want the kids to They can come together or whatever, does mm -hmm. women's things. But this is such a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. You do other stuff besides churches. I mean, you oh, yeah. speak at tons of stuff. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the Isaacs.com. Yes, sir. Their music is phenomenal, but they are super cool. Mm -hmm. I think you all will love them if you don't know them. If you're a fan of the Isaacs, um, really, I invited you because you're more popular than we are, and hopefully your fans <laughs> will like This Is Real. Aww, uh, so Jake, like us, so 
Uh, no, seriously. Thank you. Uh, no one will like our show hardly. <laughs> so my desperation is getting Lily on to yeah. get us some fans. Oh, right. you got we've had some awesome, awesome testimonies. But everyone, every testimony we've had on here has been totally different. And we've had a drug addict that came from a prostitute. We've had a, a lady whose mom was murdered. And she found her 20 years and she later. Found her I mean, we've had so many. And then here's this. And wow, what a totally different testimony. The, well, thank you just, for doing this. The, you know, the thing is, is guys, everyone has a story. Mm -hmm. You have been through something that's totally different. So don't ever think that your story doesn't matter and that God doesn't see you. He saw her that day. He saw her that day and all she did was just hunker down into the seat at the last pew and put her coat over that's and right. she wept and she knew that there was something more because there is. And that's called Jesus Christ. He and died on the cross. He died on the cross for her, her story, JP's story, my story. He's and he can do the same for you right now. I hope this I really hope this has encouraged you all today. I am like Huh. We it's, need to get this out of here because I don't want to cry. Yeah, but wow. Lily Isaacs, uh, go to theisaacs.com and check it out. Her books are there. Their music's there. I, you will not be disappointed. They mm -hmm. take trips to Israel. You know, um, and go buy some Reba McIntyre tickets to yeah, next and, because and her yeah. kids, her family, they're going to be going. opening. Wow. They're yeah. all going to be go, there. I'll go on the they're bus and work be. the table. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you coming, Lily. Your story you. is so inspirational. Thank you so much for Continue being here. Continue to do it, and let's keep her story alive, folks. That's all we can do. That's how we can honor Amen. your parents yeah, and the, sacri the, the lives that they gave. Mm -hmm. So, guys, thanks for being with us. We hope you love this. Like and subscribe. Give Lily some love and say, Lily. You're very cool. Or I love you, the feathers in your hair. She has not right. left hippiness. You know what I mean? No. Bling, I brought bling. it with me. That's why I love her. So uh, thanks for being with us, guys. We'll see you next time on This Is Real. Bye.